Aloha, I'm Lila Berg. Mahalo for tuning in to Island Focus. Today's program features interviews with leaders in our collegiate sports community. We're recording this program remotely today so that you can hear about their efforts and vision for Hawaii's athletic future. Thank you for tuning in to Island Focus. We so appreciate having the time with you today, Dave. Thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. Aloha. You have been very, very, very busy <laughs> in these past few months. Help us understand a little bit more about athletics at the University of Hawaii, where you've come, what the vision is, and definitely where we are now. You know, pre-COVID, um, you know, our, you know, a lot of our goals and you know what we're trying to focus on is it's the same. It's the health and welfare of our student athletes. It's uh, you know, education, it's uh, competition at a high level, it's teaching leadership. I mean, there's a lot of skills that you learn uh, being a student athlete um, that are very valuable that employers seek out in the future, being a member of a team. When we shifted, the, when COVID happened, you know, I remember being on the plane March 12th, coming home from the tournament that was canceled, and I thought, hey, it'd be a month. Well, it's been 13 months, and we're still, we're still going. We, we had a shift really our priority to, you know, majority of our time, just health and safety and developing protocols, you know, working with the proper government agencies, the NCA, to make sure that we could do this in a health and safe manner and bring back sports. And, you know, I mean, our, our MVPs in our department really have been our athletic trainers, uh, led by Lynn Nakagawa and our team doctor, John, John Slackey, working collaboratively with uh, the Department of Health, the NCA, our conferences, to really make sure we can provide a health and safety, uh, safe environment for our students. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the efforts they've done and really the coaches and athletes buying in, you know, to, to some protocols that are sometimes uncomfortable. Like I said, I kind of joke that I, I feel like I'm the mask police, but th th there's only good intentions that it comes from. And, and um, you know, and people of our buying in, and I think our, you know, the positivity rates we've had, the fact that we've had 12,200 tests plus, and I think it's 33 cases, you know, that's about 0 0.025. You know, we, we've done this in a health and safety ma manner, but we have to continue to be vigilant. And and knowing you, you know, and your philosophy that with every challenge, there's an opportunity. UH really actually didn't skip a beat. Here's the amazing thing is, if, if you're in collegiate athletics or student athlete, in some ways you've had a great opportunity. You've been able to continue playing. It's been different. It's been different. I mean, we traveled differently. We played a little less competition, but we've learned so much during this, I mean, right now we're, we're, we're on Zoom right now. You know, we're, we're, we're doing this on Zoom where when we did this three, four years ago, we did something like I was down, you know, we we're doing it in person. I like the in-person thing, but we've developed new skills. Uh, we're we're going to be better when we come out of this because we're going to use some of the things that we've learned. And that's the real opportunity. I mean, recruiting is going to be totally different now. We have more tools in our in our tool chest. And, and frankly, we can do some things more cost effectively. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to mind. I think in the future, I'm going to probably going to have to travel less. I'm okay with that. <laughs> that's, that's good. It saves you money, and, it, and it's also time. That said, um, you know, I am looking forward to more personal engagement. Um, that's what athletics is. It's in-person stuff, and looking forward to our fans coming back and, and having a packed arena, you know, watching our volleyball team or basketball team or water polo team and cheering them on. So is there a plan or is there um, a schedule or um, I don't know what the word is, you know, for, for bringing spectators back? Because I know that as a parent of an athlete, I loved going to practices. We've got protocols set up. But we're, you know, obviously aiming towards the fall. Right now in the tiering system, we're unable to have, you know, fans at our events. So we're, we have our protocols set. I think they're solid protocols. Uh, I'm optimistic that come fall with the vaccine rolling out and you know getting closer to herd immunity, that, that we'll have fans uh, in the fall. And, and we, we, we have the plan already. Uh, we'll continue to tweak it. We work, like I said, with all the you know agencies, the Department of Health, the NCA. If we're going to err, we probably err on a little bit on the conservative side. But that's just because you care about the health and safety of, of not just our student athletes, but our community. How is the, the stadium going to impact future sports of the UH? That's a challenge. Uh, that is brought an opportunity for us to 
uh, for the foreseeable future to have a pretty cool environment on campus to, uh, to be playing right on campus, which is pr pretty neat. A lot of colleges play on campus. It's a special thing where we can create some new traditions. We are still looking forward to um, the new stadium being built, but we have to prepare to be ready maybe for, you know, three plus years. I think right now it's 24 is when the plan is to, to the stadium to be built. We'll look forward to, to heading over there at that point. But until then, we have a great opportunity to create some tr traditions, involve the community. Uh, the good thing is our student athletes, they can just walk from the locker room right to the field. They don't have to take a bus. So there's, you know, there's some positives to really learn how to really engage our department and the university community and students. How are the other sports doing? Our, our men's volleyball team, they're, they're playing for the Big West Championship this weekend. They're number one in the country. Phenomenal job they've done, you know, on the court, off the court in the community. I mean, these are, most of these young men are getting master's degrees. I mean, COVID has gotten them more education and they've taken advantage of it. And that's, that's heartwarming. I mean, think about this. I mean, that's part of the reason we're here is to educate. Our water polo team is sixth in the country right now on a good winning streak. Our beach volleyball program just won six out of seven on the road. It's pretty heartwarming when, when, when you get from a, a few student athletes, just um, some appreciative emails about uh, some, some, appreciate what the, the trainers are doing for them or the doctors or, or the fact that they're playing and, and, and giving us some good constructive criticism of, of how we can get better. I mean, hey, the mantra we have here is we, we try to get 1% better every day and we try to do one thing better every day because we're, we're never going to get to where we want to get to. But if we continue to strive to get a little better each day and learn, um, learn each day, uh, we're, we're going we're, we're gonna to improve. And while we're talking about sports, um, and I know football is a – is a, is a key sport to be paying attention to. Title IX has an impact as well with our women's sports, and I know that you are very attentive to that. I think the special things about being at University of Hawaii is, I mean, Patsy Ming, Title IX, a lot of its roots in Genesis are from Hawaii or from one of Hawaii's own. You know, under David Laster's leadership, there's an expectation that we want to exceed what the expectations are and do the best we can. It's not always easy. It's not always easy. Sometimes you have to make some, you know, some hard decisions. Do you want it? You want it to be part of your DNA. You want it to be part of every every decision you make. You consider it, and you basically continue to head in the right direction. There's improvement we need to make in that area too. But overall, you know, compared to our peers, I I, I think we stack up pretty well. We just got to continue to to focus on it. And what, what I'm proud of, I mean, we, I got a good a good team here with Lois Mannon, our senior women administrator, and our the executive team I have, and and, and our coaches who push us to, to get better and 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 let us think if we're missing something i mean the one thing is i tell people you can't assume that we, we see it all we, we have some blind spots so you gotta once in a while grab the face mask and say you're missing this david you're missing this well thank you so much for your time and go bows yeah. go bows bows together <laughs> thank you very much david thank you thank you lila appreciate it you've just had the pleasure of getting to know david matlin athletic director for the university of hawaii mano Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, Coach. I know you have a doubleheader today, so we'll make this as focused as possible. Please share with us HPU's women's softball team, where you've come from, where you are now, and what's the vision for the future? Aloha, Laila. Mahalo very much for having me join today. Uh, Hawaii Pacific University really appreciates it very much. HPU softball was built on you know, fundamental skills, fundamental teamwork, all of the things important for a softball team. Our softball field is located at the foothill of the Ko'olaus on the Wibbard Hawaii Loa campus, uh, where we've been since 1993. Fast forward to today, we have two national championships, one NAIA and the most recent NCAA Division II title, and so we've, we've really built in that championship elite mindset into our program. Most recently with the challenges that we've faced uh, during the pandemic, we've had to adjust, we've had to pivot. We've had to make changes, not just to our program system, but also to incorporate a lot of um, mental health, mental wellness, 
social emotional wellness into the development of our student athletes. So where we've been before in being that elite program, building champions, building winners, building future leaders, have now really shifted and focused more on developing them as individuals, um, making certain that we're caring about their wellness, uh, their safety was the, the main priority. And I think that's really helped us um, shift our focus into developing future leaders, game changers in the future who will be able to adapt and shift during um, challenges similar to a pandemic. You know, you're seeing a different generation of student athletes who were faced with challenges and can now move on. That's always been my perspective of athletics in the first place, you know, team sports. During the, the shutdown of schools and the, and the change in format, it must have been very challenging, shall we say, to bring the, the women together. It really was. And, and we've been fortunate to have good senior leaders who really care for their underclassmen, who make certain that the communication is clear, that it's two-way, you know, to foster that team camaraderie and sense of belonging because a lot of our student athletes they're they're not all from Hawaii we have some as far as Virginia Colorado Canada and so their sense of home is a little different from our students our student athletes that are born and raised here in Hawaii can you speak a little bit about the scholarship process you know and how that might have impacted your recruitment but also um, the future of the, the athletes you know, scholarships in Hawaii, it's, it's an avenue for our families, our ohana, to pursue their athletic endeavors and at the same time getting that baccalaureate, that master's, and even their doctoral degrees. You know, athletics, it's an avenue. It's a, it's a means to an end for a lot of families who may not have the financial capability to send their sons or daughters to university or college. And there's many different ways to get there. You know, the four-year university is the preferred route, whether it's a Division I, a Division II, a Division III, an NAIA, or a junior college route. There is always an avenue for our students in Hawaii to get an education first and then to also pursue the sport that they passionately enjoy and love and have grown to develop their skills in. Part of the process for scholarships is getting their names out there, making certain that, you know, they have video, that they participate in tournament showcases, whether it's here in Hawaii or uh, on the continental U.S., and getting that exposure that um, would really showcase their skills and their abilities. How is that possible now at this time? Maybe now easier, but certainly in the past 15 months, it was more challenging. Oh, absolutely. I think now with this generation of student athletes, you know, they're so used to being media driven and having multiple platforms to showcase their skills. Uh, these student athletes nowadays, YouTube and other forms of media exposure, it comes natural for them. And so it's easy. It's a lot easier for coaches like myself to access information if we're looking for a particular um, student athlete, a uh, a position player, a hitter, you know, you can basically get onto Google these days, search a, a name, and you're going to find a ton of video, a ton of footage. And and sometimes, you know, it, it's stuff that you don't want coaches to see. There's a, a lot of student athletes out there who, you know, maybe through not being so familiar with how information is shared, they don't put the right information out there. And, and sometimes that gets into the wrong hands. So what's some advice or some counsel that you could give to athletes who are still in high school as we move forward from this pandemic? You know, I think it first starts um, at home with their parents and making sure that you have those conversations with your ohana on pursuing either after high school and, and trying to work towards either an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. If you're the type of athlete where you just want to continue to play, that's fine. You know, just have a plan, have a conversation with your parents. And then from there, 
you know, at school, you have so many resources, so many opportunities to research the type of school that would fit you as an individual, you know, the types of programs that you may be interested in academically, as well as the type of uh, athletic powerhouse that you want to go to. And not all student athletes will end up in the Division I level, mm -hmm. Division II. And a lot of our student athletes here in Hawaii who are academically driven, you know, they're they're participating in Division Three schools where it's completely driven by academics. And then you have your NAIA for your universities. These guys, they have a little bit more monies and they can offer a lot more scholarships than the NCAA schools. And then, of course, you have your two-year universities, which may fit a lot of our student athletes who, you know, they may not have done so well in their high school careers, but at least they'll have an opportunity to work towards an associate and with hopes to transfer into a four-year university. Well, I appreciate your perspective that academics and athletics go hand in hand. And especially here in Hawaii, we have many colleges that offer opportunities and the encouragement that you give our young people is really appreciated. Thank you. Well, I truly appreciate being here. You know, I, I do have to credit a lot of my mentors, Howard Aokita, who really brought softball to Hawaii and really grew the sport, uh, made it an avenue that uh, it is today. Brian Nakasone, who was also my co-head coach for a number of years, and Michelle Fukumoto, you know, a lot of these individuals really truly shaped um, Hawaii Pacific University softball, and they've developed me into the leader that I am today, so I really appreciate them very much. All of the families out there, please make it an, make it, make it an effort to um, have those conversations with your, your young student athlete and start looking and preparing for after high school and what they want to do. You know, go pursue a two-year degree or a four-year degree, and hopefully you, know, you can come back to the community that you grew up in and you can share your skills, your knowledge, and your abilities here in Hawaii. And check out online when HPU women's softball plays games. Yes, please. Thank you so much for joining us, Janet. Thanks so much, Lila. You've just had the opportunity to meet head coach Jarnet Lono of Hawaii Pacific University's women's softball team. So great to see you again, Glenn. Every now and then we are able to touch base. Oh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk story with you, Lila. So please tell us a little bit what's going on with the stadium. You know, this program is about collegiate sports, but the stadium is even more than sports. The stadium is 46 years old. She served as well for that time period. We had baseball there. We had concerts there. We had football there. We had mud bogs there. We had a variety of political events there. I think there was fighting that took place there. At this point, she's rusted and she's dilapidated and she's really been uh, neglected. And for the past three years, legislatively, we have really poured no money into fixing her. And we're at the point where she's just really not safe for spectators. And that's why you may have heard about how there are going to be no more spectator events in the current Aloha Stadium. But the, the stadium itself has so many possibilities in, in the future. So we're, the plan right now is tear her down and put something even more magnificent in her place. One that can really attract more than just football, but can embrace rugby and soccer. And the stadium itself is going to be the crown jewel of 98 acres. What's going around the stadium is perhaps even more exciting, which is going to be mixed use. People can live there. We can have hotels there. People can shop there, eat dinner there, go to a theater. I mean, you name it, everything is on the plate. But we really want to create a vibrant, dynamic entertainment district in that area of Halava. Can you give us a little bit of background on, on how 2019, which I believe you said was a stellar year for the stadium, how the stadium survived 2020 and where we are now and where we're going? 2019 was the best year for Aloha Stadium financially. You may recall, in addition to the UH football, the Dallas Cowboys playing the Los Angeles Rams. We had three Bruno Mars concerts that fiscal year. 
Uh, there was Guns N' Roses. There was Marshmallow. There were all of these cool folks that I'm too old to remember who they are, but they were exciting and drew in big crowds uh, to the stadium. Uh, so the stadium actually had a $1.5 million surplus in 2019. And then COVID came, and as I mentioned, due to deterioration, and the inability for the stadium to hold any fans. We are where we are today, where the stadium is closed for spectator sports, but the parking lot is still being utilized. We still have uh, the swap meet, which is actually the stadium's number one lessee, contributing more than 50% of the revenues for the $8 million budget that they have. Drive through Christmas shows, Halloween events. There was a recent uh, laser show there. They're contemplating still having the 50th State Fair there this summer. We had racing this past weekend. So the parking lot itself is bringing in revenues, but nowhere near what spectator events would have been able to bring in. So how is the stadium in the future? And, uh, and how many years are we looking technically toward? Well, if uh, we get the green light on a legislative bill this session, we hope to have what's called an RFP, Request for Proposal, out um, this summer. Announce one of our, or the, the contractor that will be the lucky recipient of building out the stadium. And keep in mind, there's two RFPs, one for the stadium itself and one for the 98 acres around it. So we're going to have those two going consecutively. But to answer your question specifically about the stadium, uh, we hope that uh, we would have a contractor named by early next year. By this time next year, we'll have dirt moving. And by the 2024 football season, we'll have a brand new stadium for all of us to enjoy. So how does that work through with uh, the University of Hawaii's plans for their football team on campus? Yeah, unfortunately, they were probably the biggest uh Let's see that was hurt by all of these renovations. So now they're looking at moving their games and expanding their 3,000 seat Ching Field into a 10,000 seat home facility uh, that's going to come at a cost of north of $8 million for them. So it's really unfortunate, but keep in mind this is a temporary move for the University of Hawaii. In the best of worlds, we would have had this kind of jointly planned out where we bring down the stadium, UH is able to move straight into the new stadium, but we just weren't able to get that all properly aligned. Seeing as this program is about collegiate sports or collegiate activities, in the future, what, besides the concerts and the mud balls and all that, what relationship do you think this, the stadium could have with, with our various universities? The university is our most important and most high profile tenant, right? They were there from day one. They were the tenant for 46 years. The swap meet came along much later on, but the stadium was built for UH football, was built for back then the Hawaii Islanders. We know that the University of Hawaii is an important uh, tenant there, but I know that uh, there are other sports that uh, could be utilizing the facility as well. Soccer in particular, we really don't have much of a rugby venue in Hawaii, but uh, the stadium will be built out for us to grow our rugby profile. I mean, the Pacific rugby is huge. Right? With Japan now getting into that kind of top tier of rugby, it's going to only grow in, in interest. So the facility in the future will fully embrace collegiate sports, plus add a couple of more sports that uh, uh, can play it there in Halama. Might be good for Chaminade or BYU or HBU as well, because we have more than one university campus. Right. I think BYU had, no longer does athletics, but certainly uh, Chaminade and HPU can utilize that facility because I know they have soccer teams on their athletic program. And softball. <laughs> uh, but that <laughs> place cannot do softball. Uh, <laughs> baseball and softball is a completely different figure, configuration than football, soccer, and rugby. What can you share with the audience in terms of yeah, inspiration, enthusiasm re regarding developing our local activities? I'm a big fan of merging sports and entertainment with economic development uh, because all of the things that we enjoy, it unfortunately costs money. The stadium doesn't light up by itself. It doesn't stay standing by itself. It needs resources. And here's an opportunity on 98 acres to bring in a substantial amount of revenue. In Hawaii, we have beautiful areas, but we really, in my opinion, don't fully monetize our prime urban lands. And here's an opportunity with the rail stop in the future to bring people there. We have 1.8 million visitors at the Arizona Memorial that need something to do after they see the memorial. We have a, so we have a ready-made audience there. And also, there's going to be an opportunity for people to live there. So you can just go down the elevator and go watch a UH football game and go get a bite to eat there. So the stadium 
that we have there right now, which is a facility sitting in a vast ocean of a parking lot, take that out of your mind. That That is not the future. The future is something that's going to be vibrant, dynamic, and super exciting for the people of this state. Well, thank you very much for sharing that vision. Uh, 50 years ago, when the stadium served its purpose, um, is a long time ago, so we are evolving. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity, Lila. We've just spoken with Glenn Wakai, Hawaii State Senator for the 15th District. Mahalo for being with us today on Island Focus. I'm Lila Berg. On behalf of the Island Focus crew and the entire team at Olelo Community Media, aloha and malama pono. Let's be kind to each other and take care of our youth. See you soon.